welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 57th episode, our guest is Rachel Dolezal. Rachel Dolezal holds an MFA from Howard University. Her scholarly research focus is the intersection of race, gender, and class in the contemporary black diaspora, with a specific emphasis on black women and visual culture. She is a licensed intercultural competence and diversity trainer dedicated to racial and social justice activism. She has worked as an instructor at North Idaho College and Eastern Washington University, where she also served as advisor for the school's black student unions and has guest lectured at Spokane Community College, the University of Idaho, Gonzaga University, and Washington State University. Dolezal began her activism in Mississippi, where she advocated for equal rights and partnered with community developers tutoring grade school children in black history and art, and pioneering African American history courses at a predominantly white university. She is also the former director of education at the Human Rights Education Institute in Idaho and has served as a consultant for human rights education and inclusivity in regional public schools. She recently led the Office of Police Ombudsman Commission to promote police accountability and justice in law enforcement in Spokane, Washington, and was the president of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP. She is the devoted mother of three sons. Dolezal garnered international attention after a June 11, 2015 interview she conducted with Jeff Humphrey of KXLY-TV. The interview begins with Humphrey asking Dolezal about hate crimes she had reported to the police. It ends abruptly after he asks her about a photo on the Spokane chapter of the NAACP's Facebook page, which shows an African-American man, Albert Wilkerson, who she claimed was her father. Address ...and that came to the Eastern Washington University faculty address for me, both were mailed from Oakland, California. And so... You know, two pieces mail from Oakland and one piece of mail that, that got dropped off at the post office. Again, it, it seems highly unlikely that an individual that had a key um, could have been at two places at once or would have flown to Oakland to mail those last two pieces. I just, I think that's, that's kind of reaching. So, Were any of those other letters from Oakland, did any of those end up in the P.O. box, your P.O. box up there? No. In fact, we had, we had a mail forwarding process where if mail would go to the P.O. box because that box was closed down after the first incident, um, it would be sent to the Main Street address. By four, but the, the piece of mail actually got delivered directly, was addressed to 25 West Main Suite 239. And the, and the postal worker that delivered it, um, I had a conversation with him and he said that it looked suspicious. And he, you know, he kind of wondered about putting it in a box, but he went ahead and did it anyway and asked me if in the future, if he sees something that looks like that again, if he should just keep it at the post office. And I said, please do. And he said he'll do that and then put just a note in our box that they got a suspicious piece of mail. There have been other so. hate crimes committed against you and your family that have not resulted in an arrest. Do you think that, that the police department is trying hard enough to get to the bottom of who's terrorizing you? I'm not sure, you know, and when it comes to uh, the formality of deciding what a hate crime is, I really, I really tried to let the police make that decision. So in the case of um, the mail, I called Crime Check 911, you know, and, and described what happened. And they said, this is a hate crime. We're dispatching an officer to you to pick up the, the evidence. Um, and the, the situation, one of the situations in North Idaho where um, my uh, two sons were out in the garden and, and saw a noose hanging from the rafters or what looked like a noose, a rope um, that hadn't been there prior. Um, they, they, you know, the officers came and they actually listed that as a hate crime toward me and my sons at that, at that particular point. And so, you know, I mean, I, I really don't want to speculate on what um, you know, which particular incidents have been hate crimes and by who, because certainly there's, <laughs> there's been no conclusion in any of these incidents with the, that have resulted in a suspect. And that is, is highly frustrating. It's been a stretch of years and certainly um, no small amount of, of stress for my kids as well as myself. So I would, would love to 
live in a in a world where hate crimes didn't exist and I could assure my children that you know it's we're safe and nothing will happen in the future I guess with regard to the noose on the rafters that turned out not to be a noose later on I don't know that that's been concluded it's a, actually a rope that was used to hang up uh, a man's that fell his deer whenever he killed deer well I wrote that I read that in your article but that was never told to me at the time and in fact when we moved into that particular house that rope was not there my sons discovered it that morning when they were picking strawberries in the little raised beds so you know people will go to all kind of lengths to minimize or discount or undermine stories you know I I certainly don't believe that there's conclusive evidence that that was not put there you know to intimidate or harass and that certainly wasn't the first appearance of a noose um, on a, you know at a residence that we lived at so that was one of eight times that you had problems you were victims of a hate crime in, in North Idaho um, again whether I, I don't know that it's eight eight hate crimes decided by the police but there were eight incidents where um, we were harassed. Yes. Sorry to hear that. You were the first to notice, hey, there's no canceled stamps on this envelope that was up in the P.O. box. There's no barcode. You kind of knew right off the bat that this probably didn't come through the mail. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear it comes down, they kind of exonerated the postal employees that put it in there. And right. now it's kind of like a key holder thing. If somebody said, God, if it's a key holder and there's only a couple of people have the keys, maybe one of the key holders did. Well, again, I <laughs> I don't have any reason to believe that. Um, and I actually wasn't the first person to notice that. One of my friends who came over to the house to kind of be supportive right after I received the mail, some of my friend, I posted something on Facebook, like, you know, don't know what everybody else got in their mail today, but I'm really shaken sh shaken up by this particular um, package. And um, some of my friends said, we want to come over. And so one of my friends, Tanya, came over, and um, at that point, when the dete when the officer arrived, he was looking at it, and she's like, "That doesn't have a po that doesn't have a stamp on it." In fact, you know, if you look at it, there's no barcode, and and um, so she's the one that, that first noticed that, but certainly it was noticed prior to the investigation. If people would hear that you have a key and they know that you've been victimized before, what would you say to the folks that say maybe? You put that letter in there because you, you were one of the people that have the keys to do so. I don't know that I even have any words for that because as a mother of two black sons, I would never terrorize my children. And I don't know any mother personally that, that would trump up or fabricate something that severe that would affect her kids. My son had slept for two weeks in my bed after we received that particular package. And he's 13 years old. That's the kind of terror that I as a mother and my son as a black male, 13 year old in Spokane, never needs to experience. And the slightest implication that I would perpetrate terror toward my kids is um, at best offensive, but I, I don't know how that would be a conscionable statement that anybody could could live with or believe. And Rachel, despite these threats that started many years ago, you continue to go out and fight for equality and civil rights, and, and you're not going to be scared off from doing this. No, I'm not. I'm not. This is something that I've actually cared about since I was a young child, and I've been involved with social justice work since middle school, high school, college. It's it's part of my life work, so, um, you know, some people might think that it actually, you know, I've had, I've heard people say something about, oh, well, you get publicity from these hate crimes, and I think that, that that's very sick as well, because it's not, that's not the kind of publicity anybody wants, is publicity of, of a negative and terrorizing scenario, especially death threats and um, photos of lynchings and as a black studies professor, I know what these images mean and take them very seriously given the, the history of, of racism in the United States.
speaking of that, did your dad ever make it to Spokane in January for the ribbon cutting? Um, n no, actually, he has um, un unfortunately has bone cancer and was not able to get cleared for surgery, and, and so. Yeah, that sounds like a terrible break for you. I'm sure that he would he would have been very proud of you. Is that your dad? Yeah, that's that's my dad. This man right here is your father? Right there? you have a question about that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was wondering if uh, <laughs> if your dad really is an African-American man. That's a very, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're implying. Are you African-American? I don't, I don't understand the question of, I did tell you that yes, that's my dad. And you, he was unable to come in January. Are your parents, not, are they white? I, I re, I re it was later confirmed by Dolezal's birth parents, Larry and Ruth Ann Dolezal, that she was born white. Dolezal subsequently resigned her position at the NAACP on June 15, 2015. The same day, she also lost her position as an instructor at Eastern Washington University and her position as a freelance writer for The Inlander. And on June 18, 2015, the Spokane City Council voted unanimously to remove her from the Office of Police Ombudsman Commission. On March 28th, Dolezal released the book she wrote along with Storm's Reback, in full color, Finding My Place in a Black and White World, through Ben Bella Books. Wilkerson wrote the foreword to the book. And now on to the show. Hello, this is Rachel. Hey, Rachel, it's Rob Burgess. How are you? Good, how are you? Oh, I've been better. I'm pretty sick, but I'll make it, hopefully. So. Uh oh. <laughs> Do you want to reschedule or? Oh, no, I'm fine. Um, I assume okay. you'll be doing more of the talking, so. <laughs> um, so, for the uh, people that don't know who you are, uh, how would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> well, um, I guess. I sometimes feel like everybody knows who I am. So, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, I guess title-wise, I just go by and now an author, artist, and activist. Okay. Um, so I've read um, about uh, three quarters of your book, um, and uh, I okay. def yeah, definitely have some questions here. I, one of the things that struck me about the book was how you approach names. In the book, you spell your last name with a, what is the name of the marker that's over the Z? The ha Hatchick. Okay. Um, what was the origin of that? Um, that's, that's a, it's a Czech name. And so it just kind of uh, des describes or signifies that you say je instead oh. of the, you know, okay. dollars all. I see. Okay. Now, does the rest of your birth family go by that last name with the, Z the, the thing over the Z, or is that something that, that you've gone with? Um, Only because I, I think when I had read uh, things about you previously, I didn't notice that, and then it seemed like it's right. Yeah, every time. Well, I think my older brother, who's also college educated, uses that. Mm. I see. <laughs> I don't know, if, you know, like some of the family who, you know, may not know that that's, you know, kind of the um, proper way to write the name or whatever, but. It's not a big deal. It's not a huge deal. It okay. just um, helps people pronounce the name. I see. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've changed your name legally again recently, right? Yeah, last year I changed my name. Okay. And what is the name that you changed to? Um, well, I wanted to keep it private, but unfortunately it got, um, you know, released in the news. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's um, in KG Diallo. And what's the origin of that? Um, it's an Evo name that was given to me. Okay. Uh, why did you decide to change it now? Well, I actually talk about this in the epilogue, so ah, you get there. I'll get there, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it was, it was a name that was given to me from the Igbo tribe and, you know, kind of like as a, um, 
kind of a, a sign of support and uh, recognition of who I am. And I embraced it in October of 2016 as my full legal name because I really, you know, a couple of things. First, I wasn't able to get a job, and a lot of the um, <clears throat> challenge of getting a job was just that my name, Rachel Dolezal, was so associated with kind of controversy and mm-hmm. just had become almost like a tabloid name. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't able to really be seen for my qualifications and experience, and um, which was another reason why I want to keep this name private. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I'm I'm trying to kind of secure a, a private life, trying to move forward, um, and and also you know, it just has a a beautiful meaning and is a fresh start and mm-hmm. represents who I am better than my birth name mm-hmm. as far as the meaning of the name. So Okay. Um, now, there's an interesting footnote at the bottom of the first page, um, and I'll just go ahead and read that real quick because I, I thought it was pretty significant because it, it kind of explains how you you know identify things throughout the book here. Um, like numerous linguists and academics, I believe black should always be capitalized when referring to culture or ethnicity. Not everyone agrees, other than Ebony and Essence, two magazines that care, uh, cater to a mostly black audience, most major publications have refused to make this adjustment. To my mind, black, uh, and you put that in quotes here in lowercase, describes a color while black, uh, that's uppercase now, like Asian or Hispanic, and those are uppercase, denotes a group of people. I don't capitalize white because white Americans don't comprise a single ethnic group and rarely describe themselves this way, preferring labels like uh, Italian American or Scotch Irish. Um, And then, of course, throughout the book, whenever you say the word black, you capitalize it and then white is uh, either in quotation marks or just uh, lowercase. So um, the thing I I didn't understand, I guess, about that was you put black not in quotes and capitalized, but you put white uh, like that, which I understand the white part, because as you say, the Italian-American or Scotch-Irish, those are groups within that. Um, Wouldn't that also, on the flip side, apply to the term black? as well, because there are groups within black, you know, that was a catch-all term, obviously, that was used to describe many different groups, so. Mm. Well, but it's, it's um, in academia, it's mm-hmm. used as well to, I mean, black with a capital B kind of made its debut during the black power movement, mm. and um, to kind of break away from the dictionary definition of um, black as a color with a lot of negative connotations and associations. And so this is the same race as a social construct. I, you know, racially, in, a, in technical terms, I identify as human. Mm-hmm. Um, but we still, as a society, don't believe that race is a social construct or don't behave that way. And mm-hmm. so... Um, there's still this really deep divide between black and white worlds in America. And philosophically, culturally, um, politically, socially, you know, I identify as black. And um, that's that's not, you know, a color of a, of a crayon. That's um, the culture and the philosophy and so forth, which, um, you know, has a capital B. Okay. Um, now, I first, of course, heard of you when that uh, famous interview of when the reporter asked you what your, uh, I don't remember the exact wording of the question, but uh, it was something about were you, and uh, do you identify as an African American, and then the interview was over. Uh, would you give a different answer today? You, you said you identify as, as black, and that uh, you obviously take pains in the book to distinguish between those two, so is that something you would answer differently today than, you know, obviously maybe you weren't ready for that particular question at that particular time, but um, is that has your answer to that changed uh, or become more nuanced or something over time? Well, my answer to the question hasn't, and, mm-hmm. you know, if I was actually asked the question in a different context, like mm-hmm. the, the answer hasn't changed. It's just um, in that particular discussion, it was a, a long interview. It was a professional mm-hmm. interview about a completely different topic. Mm-hmm. So, um there was no reason for him to 
um, get personal and and ask me that question. I didn't feel like it warranted an, a long explanation of, mm-hmm. you know, the capital B and, you know, how black is different than African American and all mm-hmm. of those. You know, I was just like, this guy is not, he's not interested in me. That. He's just trying to do this gotcha kind of moment thing. And I'm just mm-hmm. done. Um, so, you know, it's not like my identity has changed or anything like that. It's just, I didn't feel like I owed him mm-hmm. an explanation on the spot. Right. And then you talk about other times in your life where you say that that is the reason that you just let people assume what they're going to assume about your identity as opposed to having a long drawn out explanation. Is that, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now in the book, you definitely, uh, accuse some people that were uh, previously close to you to you with some pretty serious things. Uh, there's some child abuse, there's some spousal abuse, uh, there's some, uh, other pretty heavy stuff. Um, now, have you heard from anybody that you've written about in the book that you you know you've accused of these things? Are you worried about getting sued at all? Because I mean, it's it's some pretty raw stuff that you. Yeah. No. I mean, this is not new stuff. Um, some of the some of the issues have have previously been litigated, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm, I'm not accusing people of things. I'm just sharing my story. I'm writing things that happened and how they affected me and how I grew through that and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, evolved as as an individual and how some of those things affected um, my identity as, you know, woman and um, even racially and culturally and and with religion. I think there's a huge impact there as well Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the uh, abuse was tied to religion. Mm. So, you know, I mean, I'm just, I haven't heard from anybody. I don't expect to. Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess I didn't realize how much religion played a part in your uh, life story there. It, uh, some of the things that you describe are pretty uh, harrowing. Uh, you were a student at Howard University, and this was one of the first things that I heard people kind of questioning you about in the media, uh, kind of digging into your past, that you had sued them for discrimination, but one of the factors, and you described this as something your lawyer uh, kind of told you to do, was the fact that you were white. Uh, were you identifying publicly at that point as black or uh, did you see a conflict there as far as litigating that while you're you know in this transitional period of your or, well, I don't know if you were a transitional period at that point or what it was but no I hadn't um, actually I, I even didn't understand that race was a social construct at that point mm. so I hadn't openly um you know, call myself black or name myself black on forms or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was still kind of, you know, in in a conflicted sense, trying to reconcile my connection to um, the black world with being born, mm-hmm. you know, to white parents. And I think I was still, you know, to some extent letting people identify me and not really asserting my own identity at that point. But I also was submitting to my husband because that was what I was raised to mm-hmm. to do uh, religiously. And <clears throat> he, you know, he wanted to see me as white and he didn't want me to, you know, I mean, he just didn't accept my Afrocentricity at all. Um, so my identity took a regression during my five years of marriage mm-hmm. and I had to kind of repress and suppress all of, all of those, um, connections and, you know, what really nurtured my soul and who I really am. I had to, I, I pretty much just buried that mm-hmm. again, just like I had when I was a kid, um, out of deference to, to him. And, um, so, you know, the, it, it wasn't just a, like the attorney said, you know, Hey, mm-hmm. let's just use, use, um, this particular strategy out of the blue. I mean, it was mm-hmm. mentioned in, um, the moment of removing my scholarship for, for no good reason. I mean, I had a 4.0. Mm-hmm. And scholarships at Howard are only uh, rescinded if 
if you don't merit uh, keeping a scholarship by your grades. And so it was a complete shock when the chair of the department said, you know, you have white relatives and they can probably pay for it. Mm. You know, so, I mean, he brought that up. Um, go home and bond with your baby and, you know, come back when you're back in shape and have a one-year-old. I mean, he he brought up, you know, pregnancy status. And I was seven months pregnant mm. and um, with Franklin. And, you know, so it was gender, it was pregnancy status. It was, it was um, the fact that I... You know, I mean, he he was equating whiteness with with wealth and assumed that I didn't need a scholarship. Hmm. And, um, you know, that was completely incorrect because I wasn't getting a dime of assistance or, or help in any form from mm. those white relatives, you know. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, that's that's what happened. And, and of course... The media completely took that out of context and mm-hmm. and played it as if you know I just switched up my identity or something because mm-hmm. they're um, kind of shuffling the timeline a bit mm-hmm. when people assume that I hadn't yet identified as. And there's a picture in my book um, of me graduating from Howard, and you can pretty much see. Yeah, I mean, I was wearing my natural hair, mm-hmm. straight. Um, you know, like I look pretty much more similar to how I did when I was a teenager mm-hmm. than um, how I do now. So even visually, people, few people really identified me as black. There were occasionally people who just, by virtue of me going to Howard, assumed I had, you know, some kind of you know, distant black relative or something. Mm-hmm. So, right. Um, huh. Okay. Um, now, it, skipping forward a little bit again, uh, you talk about when the uh, the press started coming around and, and asking questions about your uh, identity. Um, you seem to have a particular disdain for at least the local press. Um, so, do you feel that this was a story that uh, was not worth covering, or do you just object to how they went about it? Well, I'm still kind of shocked that it that it even was news in in a way. You know, it's kind of like, um, how is this such a how how did this become a national, even global news story? But I think that it was really more news about everybody else besides me. I mean, it's news about how people view race. It's it's um, interesting how people rea- react and respond to. Um, a spoiled identity, what, you know, what sociologists call spoiled identity, which is like a stigmatized uh, or unorthodox, non-traditional type of identity structure. Um, you know, especially if it's new or not mainstream, you know, people tend to come out of the woodwork and point fingers and judge and, and misunderstand, and, and that's happened over and over in history, too. Um, before something has been socially accept, accepted or largely accepted as, an, as a um, socially legitimate, you know, identity or whatever. Um, so yeah, no, locally it was it was very hostile, and and I don't think that this actually probably would have happened if I was living anywhere else mm-hmm. in the same way. You know, it's just the dynamics that are here, the political dynamics and the way in which the the um, local police, you know, hired a private investigator, went and found the parents, you know, worked with the media to organize this big explosion and, you know, took me down. And, um, you know, it's... It, it, it sucks <laughs> yeah. living here pretty much. I mean, I wish I could move. I can't camp for three years because of my son's custody situation right. and his death. Yeah, you have to stay 200 you know. miles within range, right? Yeah, but but that was his dad actually lived in, in um, a different city when the order was. Oh, okay. The divor- so now it's pretty much almost within like 30 miles mm. um, of the. The courthouse. So, I mean, I'm at the end of my leash, mm-hmm. essentially being in Spokane, because this is an Idaho um, custody case. Mm-hmm. 
and children are considered property in Idaho until they're 18. Hmm. So, huh. can't, I mean, it's just a pretty backward, pretty backward state. Um, hmm. But be that as it may, I'm doing my best to make it forward, and, and I really, you know, try to explain and and um, correct some of the the narrative and some of the misrepresentation that was hmm. um, kind of funneled out there in 2015. You know, in my book, I really discuss, especially toward the end, you know, how this all happened, and um, you're, you're getting there. You'll you'll read that part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the plot oh, thickens, definitely. Um, yeah. You know, with 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 regards to all the the, the local players and. You know who did what and why, and um, you know it's it's kind of like it, it happened. It is what it is. I'm trying to move forward, but um, certainly it, it's been a difficult mm-hmm. two years. Yeah. Um, now you say also in the book that your plan was to eventually uh, kind of write a book anyway, or have some longer explanation of of your identity. Um, would that have looked different? How would that have differed from this book, say? Or what would you? How would you have explained it had this not all kind of exploded in the media here? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that it would have been perceived and heard in a completely different way. I mean, when whenever somebody is introducing you through an oppositional lens, or mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of like attacking a part of who you are, it's it's a different story. Mm-hmm. And that's how I was introduced, you know. I mean, that's I didn't have an opportunity to really introduce myself to the world and explain the whole context of my life journey. Mm-hmm. And I think it would have been completely different. But um, one of the things that, that was lost for me kind of forever is just the ability to to live my life, you know, um, kind of on my terms. And I would have, you know, if this wouldn't have happened, I would have still, I would still have had my job. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would still be doing advocacy work locally and, and, um, involved in the national issues. And I still care about that work. Like I can't turn that off. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. But I don't have access to. Um, I've been kind of, you know, shut out, mm-hmm. shut out from jobs, shut out from participating, just you know, in society and um, the social world. So, you know, it, I would have lived my entire life theoretically, mm-hmm. and then I would have kind of said, you know, that hey, this is this is how I was born, mm-hmm. but. This is, you know, who I really am, and I've lived my whole life this way, and these are the things that I've done, and, you know, it just, it just would have been a different, a different story. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, at one point in the book, you compare your journey to that of somebody who's, for example, a transgender person, Um, and I I think the the hardest time that I've, the hardest thing I've had, you know, to wrap my hand around with with what you're saying is that, um, you know, for uh, for example, uh, somebody born uh, biologically as as a man could become a woman, and it could work exactly the opposite way. Um, I think I think the the problem, and and I'm I'm probably not you know alone in this, but the the problem with the, or your situation or the the question I would have is uh, you you know was born to a white family, you become uh, somebody that that identifies as black. Somebody you would say that was born to a black family that was, you know, had a lot of melanin in their skin, say, or somebody that was super dark, um, they don't necessarily have that option. Uh, and then if they they would, like if they would somehow make themselves uh, go from black to white, it wouldn't, it would be seen as passing, uh, or that's kind of the term we would use for that. And it wouldn't be really seen as something empowering. It would seem uh, kind of degrading uh, in that way. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, it, there's more, I feel like there's more of, it's, it's easier for people to understand the transgender thing, maybe because it's, uh, you know, you can see the two way street of it. You know, you can go back and forth, and it, it seems like you can do that. But in this way, the, the trans, transracial thing, it, it seems kind of, you know, there's not exactly the same, uh, tit for tat I guess so what would you what would you say to that 
Well, I think it's important to understand that each category of our identity has, you know, specific social meaning and historical, you know, kind of context and and all this, you know, it's just like this this complex kind of ball of wax with, with gender and with race, and there are different um, factors, for sure, mm-hmm. historically and socially, but there is still... You know, the history of patriarchy, I mean, I don't think people really talk about that much in in terms of transgender. Like, if you go from Mm -hmm. male to female, are you losing your male privilege? Yeah, that's a good point. um, Chimamanda Adichie recently mentioned that, you know, she she didn't really feel like trans women understood the full experience of a woman because they hadn't been, you know, like a woman their entire life and had male privilege for, especially if they transitioned later in life, you know, had male privilege and, um, and then, you know, made the, made the transition, but they had still enjoyed male privilege for most of their life. And, and I think, you know, a lot of trans women, um, like Laverne Cox kind of, kicked back a little bit to that push back and said, mm-hmm. you know, even when I was a boy and or seen as a boy, I still, you know, was being called a girl. And, mm-hmm. um, and that actually, you know, it, as much as the two conversations are different, the, I followed a lot of, um, transgender, uh, dialogue because it, it speaks to me. I mean, because in that sense, like, even when I was identifying as white, you know, I was constantly being told I was black. And, you know, in Mississippi especially, um, like, you know, you're part black. You know, you know you're just passing for white. You know, so it's, it's kind of like who the person really is does come through. And um, it's not necessarily the same level of maybe privilege or kind of just a unilateral sense of um, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, whiteness or maleness or whatever that is seen because because you're, you know, you have this this spirit, this sense of self that's, that's different. So, and then some of the transition um, experiences that I've, I've had so many people reach out to me. There's actually one individual who identifies as transracial and was born black male mm-hmm. and identifies as white female and is doing the, the melanin reversal and, um, you know, facial reconstruction and things like that. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, people point to Michael Jackson as an example of, of what's possible too. I think that there's for sure a, like you said, when there's an oppression historically mm-hmm. in a certain direction, um, it's seen as disempowered for the historically oppressed group to assimilate, mm-hmm. you know, toward the historically oppressive group. Um, and at the same time, that's actually been more socially acceptable in terms of racial passing with regards to people passing for white that that had, um, you know, black families or were originally categorized as black, you know, living an entire life as a, a white person mm-hmm. for access, you know. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, of course they do that because they were able to get a job or, you know, mm-hmm. able to do this or that. So it's understandable. Right. And I think when, when my story hit, people were just, kind of thrown off by that. Like, why would you go the other way? Mm. You know, why would you kind of exile yourself from um, white privilege and, and the white community if you had access to that? And uh, I think it requires just a really clear sense of self and, um, you know, commitment to, to being exactly who you are, whether it's transgender, you know, trans black, whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to really know who you are in order to um, cross the color line or the gender line. Mm-hmm. But yeah. anyway, I know you have uh, an appointment, and uh, you only have a half hour, but I always ask this at the end of every interview. What music have you been listening to lately? 
Wow. Um, well, I have a 15 year old son, so so you know, Chance the Rapper is kind of um, recent music. Um, yeah, Kendrick Lamar, mm-hmm. things like that. Okay, cool. <laughs> I listen to whatever the kids are listening to. Yep, so. basically. Um, so is there anything else I didn't ask you about? I'd, I'd love to talk to you again, but is there anything else yeah. I didn't ask you about this this time that you'd want to get in there? No, I, you know, I do hope that people read the book. I think you can't really, you know, understand or, or respond to the story without knowing the whole story. So, you know, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I even saw it, that it's in Costco right now. Mm. So wow. you never know what, where you'll see it, but pick up a copy and um, and I think that you know it's a, it's a human story and and it will relate you know a lot of different levels to other people's experiences as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, thank you for your time and I do hope you feel better soon. <laughs> thank you. It does suck to be sick. Yeah, <laughs> we, we've been going around and around with the, the family here. So if one person sick, it's just a matter of time basically. So, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you know yeah. how that goes. But um, anyway, thank you so much for the taking the time and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. All right. All right thanks. Bye. 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 If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at www.patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review the podcast everywhere it's available, which includes iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. It really helps. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com.
Until next time.